Good evening and welcome to Resia, the research seminar in Islamic arts. Thank you for coming tonight. And I'm very happy to have uh, Domenico in genital with us, who is going to talk uh, to us. He's in Los Angeles. And uh, Los Angeles is a bit cold, he says, but not as cold as London. <laughs> uh, you can see it the way I'm dressed. Anyway, so let me just introduce Domenico. I'm so happy you're here. Um, Domenico is an associate professor of Persian literature at the University of California, Los Angeles. And in coming, Bahari fellow in the Persian arts of the book at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. So very interesting for us to have you here from spring 2023. Um, his research interests Center on Medieval Persian Poetry, Visual Culture of Iran and Central Asia, Gender and Translation Studies, and Manuscript Culture. His most recent articles are Hafez Shirazi Turk, A Geopoetical Approach in Iranian Studies, and The Marvelous Painting, The Erotic Dimension of Saidi's Praise Poetry in the Journal of Persianate Studies. And his most recent uh, book, also quite hefty book, is Beholding Beauty, uh, Sadi of Shiraz and the Aesthetics of Desire in Medieval Persian Poetry, uh, published by Brill in 2020. And his Italian translation of Foro Farohazad's collected poems, along with all original texts, will be published in 2023 by Bompiani. Is currently working on an English translation of Selection of Saadi's poems for University of California Press and a monograph on kingship, poetic creativity, and homoeroticism in the context of Ghaznavi praise uh, poetry. So can I remind the audience to write your comments and questions in the chat, and I will read them to Domenico after his presentation, which today is on a rather in intriguing topic called uh, The Visible and the Unseen, Reframing the Persian Tale of the Greek and Chinese Painters. Domenico, thank you again, and over to you. Hello. Hi, Anna. Hi. Thank you so much, Professor Contadini. I'm very honored, very pleased to be here with, with you and with your wonderful, wonderful audience of this uh, series, of this uh, workshop series that you so wonderfully, beautifully organized and run. I uh, Today we'll be talking about a topic that is part of the new um, horizons on my research interests. So I apologize if you will find my my arguments to be rather unpolished, my translations even less polished. And uh, I also need to clarify that um, what I'm bringing together, the materials that have been collected, uh, make sense only thanks to the work of wonderful scholars who preceded me and who worked on, on this specific topic of Nizami's narration of the competition between Chinese and Greek artists. Scholars such as Priscilla Sujek, uh, Christine Warumbeke, and Margaret Graves, who published very recently a beautiful, beautiful article on the afterlives, on the visual afterlives of, of this story. So I, I very much indebted to them, and I, I wish to uh, with my very modest contribution today, I wish to start bridging the gap between the history of Persian literature and the way we look at um, the way um, the, 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 the importance, the relevance of sight, of beholding, of seeing, as it is represented in the Persian literary classics, and all the speculations and analysis that have been produced over the decades from the perspective of art history. So I, I really wish that through this kind of conversations and opportunities, this workshop in particular, we will be able to sort of meet with other scholars who work on the same texts and the same problems from slightly different angles. Um, I prepared a PowerPoint and I'm going to launch it 
now with your permission. May I? Uh, here it is. I'm sharing my screen first. Sure, we are looking forward to it. Here it is. Here it is. I can launch it now. Uh, and voila. So, uh, as you mentioned, the title of this talk is The Visible and the Unseen, Reframing the Persian Tale of the Greek and Persian Painters. I will start with two lines, two baits, two districts by my poet, my favorite poet, Sadio Shiraz. I dedicated an entire monograph to his little poetry. But here we can see how the problem of vision, the connection between the visible and invisible, um, urges us to ask specific questions. So we see, I read the English translation, sit with the beloved for some time, forgetful of this world and the next. You will see wondrous images more alluring the Chinese and Greek paintings. It's a very interesting reference to the story that I'm about to share with all of you. For this meaning, Mani, a for, for this meaning, a form is required that only Sadi can beautifully craft. Anything that surfaces from the soul finds its reflection on the surface of the heart. Many irons on the fire here, you can see. So we have reference to this mysterious um, parallel of Chinese and Greek paintings. The idea that it's Chinese and Greek paintings, this picture gallery can appear in one's imagination before one's eyes when sitting next to an object of desire, possibly a real object of desire. And then we can see how this quest for beauty um, is conveyed through the quest for a meaning that needs to find, needs to lend onto a form. A sohan, a speech that poets can craft in a beautiful way. And by doing so, create a parallel between what appears through the soul and what emerges on the heart of the beloved, of the of the lover and the beholder. So I will return to these lines at the end of my presentation to, to bring all these different threads together and see why we are here talking about Chinese and Greek paintings. Um, some of you might be familiar with Sadio Shiraz. He died in 1292 in, in Shiraz. He studied in Baghdad at the famous Nizamiya school. His major works are the Sadi Name or Bustan, Golestan, complete, completed between the 1250s and 1258 CE, of course, and then collection of Ghazals. I, I, I work mostly on, on, these, on these collections and lyric poems. I'm working also on his obscene works. I, you know, thankfully, I will not share any obscene lines today. And then he, he was active also among the most important political figures of his time, specifically in uh, in Fars, the Atabegane Fars, the Atabegs of Fars, the Salgorit dynasty. Um, we know that he was, uh, we don't know whether he was attached to a Sufi order, to Tariqa, but he uh, did have a Sufi lodge that was built on his behalf by the Jubaini family, who were the chief financial officers of the Ilkhanid state, by right, the early period of Mongol presence in Iran. Um, I will start with a passage that can set the tone for this whole conversation today on the visual experience. What is a visual experience? What does it mean to behold beauty beyond the boundaries of what is visible to the external senses? Uh, and I'm very interested in analyzing this kind of experiences from a rational point of view while recognizing the spiritual importance of all speculations that derive from the Sufi tradition. So Sadi, in the opening of his Golestan of Rose Garden, which is a collection of beautiful anecdotes, some of which are biographical, some of which are pseudo-biographical, on, uh, on, on different, on different uh, aspects of, of life in, in, in medieval Iran, and it was crafted as a mirror for princes, so in order to instruct princes how to become, if not perfect human beings, to become perfectly human. And in the opening uh, pages of this book, Sadi 
talks about this visual experience of a master of the heart, a Sohebdel. One of the masters of heart, Sadi says, entered into a state of visionary rapture till drowning in the ocean of unveiling. So this is a metaphysical experience. It's a Sufi practitioner who experiences a connection with the invisible, the unveiling, the Mukashapa. As soon as, um, as soon as he emerged from this imaginal transaction, Muamila, one of his associates asked him with joyful enthusiasm, what presents are you bringing for us from the garden of fragrances that you visited? The master of the heart, the Sufi, replied, I was resolved to fill my robe with gifts for my companions once I reached the rose bush. But as soon as I approached it and started picking the roses, the fragrance of those roses intoxicated me so deeply that I lost control and dropped all of them. So here Sadi is playfully um, sharing with us this, the experience of contemplating the invisible, the metaphysical realm, through images that are particularly sensory. So we see how the senses are called into this exploration of the invisible. And it is on the basis of this connection between the visible and the invisible and the relevance of the senses and sensory experiences that I want to explore a story that was mentioning in the opening today that has been explored by many, many scholars, particularly by art historians, and uh, specialists of Persian literature are starting only now to reread and rediscover uh, this, this wondrous, wondrous narration that is found in the Khamsa or the quintet of master of medieval Persian poetry, narrative poetry, Nezami of Ganja, who flourished in the 12th century and uh, composed these five masnavis, or five narrations, long narrations in verse, uh, one of which is referred to as the Sharaf Name, or Eskandar Name, which is the narration of the uh, Gesta, the, 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 all the, the adventures of Alexander the Great. And in particular, I want to focus on this story of the competition between Greek and Chinese painters. How does the story begin? Alexander happens to visit China. He's being hosted by the, the, the emperor of China, and they indulge with with libations and and you know, even much less, a proper much less, a proper gathering. And in the tradition of the Hellenistic and Persian majalis um, or gatherings, they start having conversations about. The beauty of the arts and the excellence of humankind and different uh, groups of, of, of people in specific in specific fields of knowledge. Um, so they're talking about who is the most excellent in the art of poetry. So they, they're the most eloquent people are from Arabia. Uh, poetry uh, and music originated from Khorasan, whereas musical instruments come from from Baghdad and so on. At some point, the question that lands on the floor of this charming conversation is who is the absolute master in the art of painting? And of course, the Chinese and the Greek are the, uh, are the peoples who are, who are referred to. And, and uh, being Alexander of Greek origin and being his, his host, <laughs> the Chinese emperor, you can see how heated this conversation became. So decided to uh, settle their dispute through a, an actual, a pragmatical uh, competition, a real competition. So eventually, and here, these are my poorly translated lines. I apologize. Again, this is a work in progress. We're recording this session. It will be available, but please, if you, we have a conversation about this topic within a few months or years when hopefully this work will be published, and probably I might present completely different uh, solutions to, to, this, to these questions. So eventually, they decide to solve their dispute by building a vault the curves like an eyebrow. The painters hung a curtain between the two curves of the vault. The Greeks were supposed to work on one side. The Chinese would paint the other side of the vault. So they separated the two groups. They would see each other's work only when the competition was over. As soon as they finished, the drape would be removed from the middle. And only then would everyone see with which one of the two paintings appeared most wondrous. Key words here, are wondrous noayin noayin tar noayin tar will be come back will be coming back to this kind of vocabulary that refers to 
awe inspiring arts, including poetry and, of course, visual arts. So we have this competition. There is a veil between these two arches, uh, these two porticos that are being painted by these two groups. The two groups of painters started working in the secret chambers of, this, of those two vaults. Nahoft is this constant reference to something that's hidden beyond one side, beyond one gaze, where the art, the artwork is being produced. After a little while they were done, the curtain was removed from the two paintings. There was one painting for, for two Artangs. Artang or Zhang is this mythical, maybe not so mythical, uh, um, album of paintings by Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, Iranian, and to which Persian poets refer constantly. Their shapes and colors were exactly the same. All onlookers were amazed by that effect and were suddenly absorbed by speculations. They revealed that the two paintings were exactly the same thing, even though the two groups of painters, the Chinese and the Greek artists, could not communicate with each other. The final result of their work was exactly the same. Uh, we go back to this language that keywords that that's why I want to offer this close reading, but it's important. This is something that uh, Persian literature historians should be, and, and also work in collaboration with art historians to refashion our critical understanding of this story. So Ajab Man, so they were Ajab uh, Ta'ajob, they were bewildered. They were amazed, they were ravished by this thing. And they were cast into speculations. Ibra, it's an interesting word. So Ibra, Ibra, we come back to this, right? Which means to cross a boundary, to make any, to, 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 to perceive something, to, to, you know, to have a, a, some sort of a intuition about something. Wondering how these two groups of painters could have produced two art tanks that equal each other. So they were all amazed by this. Alexander sat between two arcs and observed both paintings carefully. I want to stress the, the uh, narrative care and attention to details that Nesami dedicates to this narration, showing how the eye of the beholders is constantly at work trying to analyze and comparing uh, with this, this, these images with one another. So the, the, he was observing carefully. He could not spot any difference between them. You see how slow the pace of the narration is and how the importance of this, this um, a considerate observation of the world is being showcased in these in this, in this lines. He could not penetrate the veil of their mystery. It's an important keyword as well. Raz pardei raz eshan, pardei raz, the veil of mystery. We'll see how this expression comes back in other, in other stories. So understanding the mystery of this, the reflection of this, the, 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 the similarity the, um, between these two paintings is represented as a veil of mystery that needs to be deciphered by the onlookers. For a while, his gaze tried to unveil that mystery again, but he could not figure out the secret of those images. Then something happens. Um, I'm going to look at some point that, at some point next year in Oxford, I will be looking at manuscripts uh, from this book as well, because I want to understand what really happens in this specific moment where a certain Farzane is mentioned. Farzane, wise man, is this Alexander? Is this someone else? Is it a, a wise man, a scientist who was present? who would travel with Alexander, who was a philosopher who was witnessing this scene. There is confusion in the manuscript tradition about, about the meaning of this line. And there are some variants that deserve to be taken into account. For now, let's say that it's a third party. When a wise man saw those two idol temples, he was ravished by that astonishing picture. Badi, it's another key word. Hajab, Badi, Shegeft, we'll see, found, uh, we'll see this later. But as he was ravaged by that astonishing picture, he asked for the curtain hanging between the two balls to be removed. We start to play with the curtain, see what happens if we remove again the, 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 uh, the curtain. When the curtain separated the two chambers was lifted, one ball seemed dim, the other was shining. The, lo the, lost, the luster of the Greek colors and forms shone upon the mirror of the Chinese. The king was struck by wonderment, shagetti, another key word, 
referring to the awe inspiring uh, art. He saw that the Chinese vault had no pictures. Once more, he lifted the curtain, the original image of, appeared again on the Chinese vault. So what we discovered that, that the Chinese did not do anything but polishing the wall. The artists were actually the Greek who physically painted the materially created this image on their own section of the vault, the arch. And then the only thing that the Chinese did was to polish. Most of you are familiar with the story. I'm just showing how meaningful the slow pace of the narration is to see how important the specific keywords are and the way that they allow the eyes of the listeners and the readers to imagine how, what, how the, eye, the eyes, eyes were wandering in this, in this narration. So he understood that the bright vault acquired images thanks to polishing. We reached the end of the story. Yes, there was a difference between the two images indeed. One would acquire, the other would project. Uh, two other important keywords. In mi pazirotto an mi namud. Pazirostan, to acquire, in namudan, to project, to shine upon. While the Greeks were actively painting, the Chinese were polishing their side of the wall. All paintings that took shape on the Greek wall shown on the receding surface of the Chinese side. This is why the final ruling Alexander had to decide eventually who is the ultimate master in the art of painting, they both won. This is why the final ruling was the following. Both actions are necessary for the purpose of vision. This sounds like a, um, a, 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 a very nice and polite way of, of uh, assessing right, and resolving this dispute, but it's, I, I want to meditate on this, this idea that both actions, polishing and painting, acquiring and projecting, as we can see here, also these two keywords, are necessary yavari, for the purpose of vision, basar. Basar can also mean the eye or vision, it's both the organ and, and act of, of seeing. What does it mean? What does it mean? What is Nezami trying to say? And here, I am quoting, I apologize for doing this, it's not particularly elegant for my own book, the eighth chapter dedicated to aspects of this story in the broader context of the quest for the invisible in its erotic context. Um, uh, Nizami's final gloss is particularly interesting. Polishing and painting are equally necessary for the purpose of vision, Basar. While Priscilla Sujek has analyzed this story from the perspective of Nizami's assimilation of the theories of perception into the literary representations of visual arts, Christine Varouimbeke has convincingly demonstrated what the philosophical underpinnings of this anecdote are. As a further elaboration of the perspective of these two scholars, I would be inclined to read Nizami's remark on polishing and painting as a gloss on the different roles of the internal senses in managing the relationship between optical vision and the imaginative faculties. In fact, at the end of the narration, the author refers to the Greek painting as a projecting Minamud image, whereas he qualifies the Chinese counterpart as the receiving Mipazirov depiction. Let's take a look at the theory of the internal senses. So we know that this is a, a paradigm that was developed well before Ibn Sina wa Avicenna, the Persian uh, philosopher and polymath who flourished right between the 10th and the early 11th centuries. And he, he uh, systematized what was already available, uh, showing how the brain is, can be divided in different ventricles and different parts that in which there are different functions and different faculties known as the internal senses are lodged. We have a common sense that collects and coordinates the sensations received by the five external senses. Then we have a retentive imagination, khayal, which stores all the images that are collected by individuals through sensorial intellectual experience via the common sense of the practical intellect. So this is the retentive, the storage room of whatever the senses can perceive. And then we have the composite imagination. It is the faculty that allows the formation of dreams and visions, which shapes images that do not correspond 
to objects that exist in the world of external senses. And one of my um, example with my students when talking about it in the, 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 the internal senses is imagine that I have two wings appearing from behind my shoulders or two to stay in Iran epics. See two snakes appearing from my from my from my shoulder blades. You're using, if you imagine that, you're using your composite imagination. You're combining images that were stored in your retained imagination and creating something completely new, right? If you close your eyes. Then we have the estimative, wahm, that receive the non-sensible, pre-intellectualized concepts, ideas, or meanings that relate to specific objects of visual perception. Then we have semantic memory, which is storage room of wahm or the estimative. Now, Nezami was familiar with this tradition. Um, and um, given Nizami's familiarity with the Hellenistic philosophy and the Avicennian model of the internal senses, we could look at the projecting and receiving images as analogs of the faculty of the composite imagination and of the common sense as a screen upon which images are impressed, respectively. Therefore, the story could be read, could be reread as Nezami's meditation on the role of the internal senses in the processes of intellection and the empirical observation of reality. That's why we can explain why there is this constant narrative emphasis on witnessing how the eyes can witness and what happens, right? So we can see how these two we can look, we can think about these two chambers, these two vaults as, as an enactment of how the internal senses communicate with external senses and vision is produced in, in one's mind. Um, this analogy helps us reconsider specific aspects of Al-Ghazali's spiritual approach to the same narration. We know that this story was narrated by Al-Ghazali, one of the most important uh, Islamic thinkers who died in 1111 from Eastern Iran. And uh, I've been working mainly on his Persian um, treatise, um, uh, Kimya Sadat, The Alchemy of Bliss. And he has this beautiful chapter in his most famous compendium of religious sciences, known as Ihya Ulum al Din, Revival of Religious Sciences. Uh, in the chapter called The Marvels of the Heart, in which he tells the story. So Al-Ghazali was flourishing uh, a few decades before, before Nezami, and they were both drawing upon uh, a similar, um, probably similar version of the stories, um, but they, 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 they turned their narration to, they took their narration toward different horizons of meaning. Let's read what Al-Ghazali says about, about this story. So they lifted the veil, and behold, on their side there shone forth the wonders of the Greek skill with added illumination and dazzling brilliance, since that side had become like a polished mirror by reason of much furbishing. Thus, the beauty of their side was increased by its added clearness. The care of the saints, and this is the way that Al-Ghazali interprets this story, in cleansing, purifying, and clarifying the heart, until the true nature of the unseen, the invisible, shines forth clearly therein with utmost illumination, is the work of the Chinese. The care of the learned and the philosophers in acquiring and adorning knowledge and the representation of this adornment in the hearts is like the works of the, the work of the Greeks. So he's comparing Sufis and saints, spiritual masters, with philosophers and scientists and see how both groups of people can reach the truth through different ways of working on their internal and external senses in connection with the uh, sacred knowledge and the invisible. This analogy helps us reconsider specific aspects of Al-Ghazali's spiritual approach to the same narration, which he tackles in the context of a discussion of the preserved tablet, Luh Mahfuz, that is included in the 21st book of Ihya. In his version, Al-Ghazali compares the Greek artists to the philosophers and the men of wisdom who attain spiritual knowledge through study and discursive inquiry. The Chinese painters, on the other hand, stand for the Sufis and the saints who access the supernal preserved tablet by polishing the surface of their hearts to receive the reflection of the unseen. From Al-Ghazali's wording, one can detect the paramount relevance of the visual dimension in the effects of these two approaches 
On the one hand, we found the wondrous colors of the Greeks, whereas the Chinese achieved the same result without applying any color. By doing so, Al-Ghazali presents the speculative and the contemplative paths as approaches that are equally valid, just as the final result of the Greek and the Chinese painters are equally beautiful. Interestingly, Al-Ghazali mentions that the reflecting process has bestowed great clarity upon the Chinese image. This is something that also appears in Nizami's story, but is not as evident as in this specific passage by Al-Ghazali. This concise observation has induced some scholars to assume that the Iranian theologian narrated this parable to defend the supremacy of the contemplative over the speculative, of the Sufi way over the inquisitive path of the philosophers. However, as noticed by Ibn Khaldun in his commentary on the passage, Al-Ghazali's symbolic juxtaposition functions as an analog of the two facets of the heart, rational soul, one of which opens to the external world, whereas the other peruses the celestial matrix of creation, the preserved tablet. We should therefore explain the less clear image rendered by the Greek painters by the veiling effect of the curtain of the body, whose material nature tends to obscure the clarity of the images descending from on high. So here Al-Ghazali opens a whole, a whole new window on the problem of vision beyond the boundaries of the visible world, something that is contained also in Nezami, but from a completely different perspective that dwells more length on the perspective of the philosophers, on the physiological, philosophical possibility of seeing and representing how vision takes place. What is the problem of polishing the mirror of the heart? The idea is that the human heart, in the Sufi tradition to which Al-Ghazali belongs and which he crystallizes, the human heart acts like a mirror that is naturally capable of reflecting the unseen, the invisible world, referred to as the preserved tablet or the matrix of the book, or umul kitab, like the Quran, or in Avicennian cosmological terms, the soul of fixed stars or the active intellect. So there is the idea that the macrocosmic matrix of the world is reflected onto the microcosmic presence of the heart, which is like a mirror that can see, can reflect what is next to God, right? This, this metaphysical matrix of the world. The body, however, along with its carnal passions and external perceptions, veils the heart and prevents it from visualizing the supernal realm of the unseen. And Sadi, for instance, says the heart is the mirror that reflects the form of the unseen, provided that no rust covers its surface. So we can have different ways of visualizing the invisible through a close approach to the perception, the sensory perception of the world, of the visible, visible world. So if we follow Al-Ghazali's um, narrative, we can have a rational inferential approach, which keywords like Ibra, Tafakur, and Tamur, which are found also in Islamic narration, teleological contemplation, sacred eroticism, to observe beauty and infer, produce an inference, an intuition about the origin of this beauty. And then there's an imaginal cosmological approach, dreams, spiritual training, and uh, sama, or listening to music. So we can see how these are all ways of thinking about the invisible by operating, by modifying the connection between our body and the world that, that surrounds us. In fact, we will find here um, a beautiful passage by Al Ghazali in Persian from his book Alchemy of Bliss, Kimia al Swadat, that parallels what Sadi was telling us in the opening of the Golestan about the visionary experience. And here we can find all the physiological and philosophical elements drawing upon Abyssinian theories of perception, in internal sense, and then which were also rever reverberating throughout the Nizami's work. We'll see how we can finally create a, a chamber of resonance between these different sources. Ghazali says, those who turn invisible to themselves and to their own sensations, and as it, as it is customary in the beginning of the path of Sufism, delve into their own selves and plunge into the remembrance of God, will have a taste of the other world's realities through the process of witnessing, mushahada. This is because the carnal soul, by going dormant and weakening, 
does not prevent them from accessing the truth of their essence. Therefore, their condition would be akin to that of the dead. Anything that to the others is unveiled to death would become accessible to them in this world. In most cases, whenever they come back to themselves and to the sensible world, like the Sohib Del, the master of the heart that the Sadi was describing, they might have no recollection of that experience. And if they recall something, they might talk about it. And if, sto if the storage of their imagination, this is a technical word to refer to the Abyssinian um, retentive imagination, Chazanei Chayal, depicts the recollections, it will appear as an image. For image, images can be best stored in the memory so that they may be, may be retrieved. So we can see how here Al Ghazali is trying to combine philosophical speculations of the internal senses and the actual vision with the Sufi path leading to the contemplation of the invisible. Why am I interjecting these passages to shed further light on Nezami's story of the Greek and the Chinese painters? Uh, let's keep these two different strands of materials next to each other, and let's go a bit deeper in other passages from Nezami's works in which there is a strong emphasis on the act of painting and contemplating beauty. So we have um, this other poem by Nezami Ganjevi, Half Pekar, or the Seven Beauties, or the Seven Celestial Bodies, uh, which is the representation, is the story, of, is, is the coming of age story of the pre Islamic Iranian Shah King Bahram, Bahram Gur, and how he discovers one day in his palace that there are seven beauties, the seven princesses from the seven climates of the world who could be, be invited to his court and tell him a story every single, every different days of the week in association with a different celestial body. The poet says, in the fashion of the Majan Zand Avesta, this book is adorned with seven brides, so that the brides of the celestial spheres may be hold for once my brides and assist each other one by one through cooperation and co-decoration. The, ma the macrocosmic and the microcosmic reflecting each other in the production of poetry, in the production of a poetry that is about vision and visual contemplation. So we can see how the creative act of the poet seeks assistance through the, the possibility of finding connection between the visible and the invisible, between the microcosmic and between the macrocosmic and the microcosmic. Later in the book, he talks about the story of Turan Docht, this beautiful princess from Turan, who was an accomplished scientist and painter. And let's look at how he describes her, her um, accomplishments. Besides beauty and a sweet smile, she was adorned with the gift for science. Having learned wisdom from all disciplines, she wrote pages on every art and read about the occult, sciences, and witchcraft from all the world's books on magic. She knew the temperaments of all celestial bodies and compared the elements with one another. She knew what makes all human, humans human and what the stars allot humankind. That angelic woman who lived in a castle was also a painter of the Chinese picture gallery. Whenever she touched a painting with her brush, cars would solidify like pearls inside the shell. With her brush, as dark as the virgins of paradise tresses, she painted with light upon the shadows. Here there is this esoterical approach to painting to the arts, which is not completely detached from the philosophical and learned processes that at work in the Iskandar Namein, the story of the Greek and Chinese painter. But we can see how here Nezami is sort of creating a new layer of meaning for the mystery of visual representations, specifically in the context of this magician, artist, scientist who know the secrets of the world. And this, I'm very, I'm very fascinated by this line. Soyero Nach Barzadi Aznu, she could paint with light upon the shadows. Let's keep following this thread. I don't have specific answers for what this really means in the context and the overall context of Nizami's work, but I want to compare these passages with another set of story, another story, and then I will be done. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm taking too long today. Uh, this is also a narration some of you might be familiar with already from another book, Kostro Shirin, by Nezami, 
uh, in which in the very some of, one of the first chapters we, we this young prince of Iran, Khosrow Khosrow Parviz, is seeking a lover, a beloved, and his bon, bon companion Shapur, who is a painter and artist as well, finds a solution and he knows of a beautiful princess named Shirin who lives in Armenia. And he devises a stratagem to allow them to meet and fall in love with each other. So the king had a special boon companion named Shapur, who traveled the world from Morocco to Lahore. His painting skills could have inspired money. He could teach Euclid the art of geometry. He was an expert calligrapher and a talented portrait painter. Brushless paintings would emerge from his imagination. Is it very important? Priscilla Sujak has a few thoughts about this image. I would like to take them a bit further. The idea that he could paint without a brush, only through the act of imagination. This is also important. Let's try to compare this in our mind with what was happening in the story of the Chinese and the Greek painters. What is the role of the imagination? How did imagination digs into the relationship between the visible and the invisible it, through the relationship between what is represented and the source of representation. So it's not just about the mimetic um, um, correspondence between what is visible and what can be represented, but it's about the work of the imagination in creating parallels between these two different realms. What is Shapur's strategy? He decides to cause Shirin to fall in love with Hostel by painting his portrait, his image, and hanging it there on a tree in the place where Shirin and her companions and friends were, 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 were playing. She sees the portrait for the first time. They brought that portrait to Shirin. She contemplated the image for several hours. Again, we have again the idea of pondering, meditating, contemplating slowly. The process of the mind approaching the visual through, um, through a with a slow pace. At a slow pace, she could not take her eye. She could not take her eyes off of it. Nor could she decide to take it with her. Every glance upon it made her made her drunker, beside herself with any new sip from that cup. Her companions torn apart that very fine portrait, which would cause Chinese paintings to pale. The comparisons with what the Chinese were doing is also this, this intertextual, infratextual actually correspond is also particularly fascinating. When Shirin asked about that portrait, they told her that demons must have limbed such a such a simulacrum. And here this important keyword team sal, ten sal. They, they, they tore that apart. Host, um, Shapur decides to repaint the same painting and try again. So Shirin sees that again for the second time. Where Shirin, where Shirin lifted her eyes one more time, she looked again at the spiritual simulacrum. Her soul's birth took off from her chest. Her tongue was locked. She could not utter a word. She asked her friends, crying, what is this situation? She was wrong, for that was imagination. It's a very interesting line, too. She was asking, what's happening? What's Shehalas? It's a very colloquial way of saying, what's happening to me? Why is this painting here again? And then the poet interjects the narration and he says, she was wrong. It was not a hall, hall meaning also state, presence, affair, conditions. And he said that was the work of imagination, creating a pun between halas and chayalas. Also very interesting correspondence between the, po the, the, the possibility of images to come to, 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 to reach a form and imagination that can model those, those forms. Shirin sees the portrait for the third time. It's a longer excerpt that is not translated at the right time. And eventually they decide to address Shapur, who reveals himself. Shapur responded, there is so much to say about this image, which for me originates from behind the veil of mystery. Have we found this expression already? Yes, the behind the veil of mystery Pardeye Raz is exactly the same expression that Alexander was using when trying to crack the mystery of the Chinese and Greek paintings corresponding to each other. So it, we, it's interesting that there is the idea that, that the, the art uh, of Shapur also 
is being uh, is coming out from behind the veil. And she responded, I fell in love with this image so deeply day and night that I would say that you'd say I became a worshiper of idols. Eventually, Shapur says, I am the painter whose compass lent the image of Prince Hosro. Although every portrait that the painter paints shows a sign, Neshan, it has no soul, John. There are different ways of reading the connection between John and Neshan. I read this as the Persian ways of referring to the, to the dichotomy between images and mental contents, suwar and ma'ani, that comes up constantly in the Sufi speculations between on the context on the relationship between the visible and the invisible. I was taught how to paint, but the garments of the soul are crafted elsewhere. What does it mean? Meaning that I'm painting a sign that is like an impression, but the origin of this sign, the real money, is somewhere else, which corresponds to the physical presence of Hosro. This is also an interesting, again, uh, I'm really curious to see how art historian would read these lines because they, sh they, they, they tell us something beyond the mere discourse on mimetic correspondence between the work of art and, and external reality. There's this idea that the work of art is leading the eye toward the origin, toward the mani that needs to be discovered behind the veil, which corresponds to nothing but more experience or actual experience of the world. If you are so ravished by Husserl's portrait, wait and see what happens when you see him in person. You see a world created from light. Despite having no experience of the world, light will shine in your eyes. I'll stop here for now, even though I have a Ghazal by Saadi. We can read this together during the Q&A, or I can just leave it here on the screen. Go but... on. Sorry? Please go on. Okay. So there is this... Um... I don't have conclusions. My conclusion here is, what can we do with these materials when they are rotating around each other and they're sort of telling us something more about any simplistic literary uh, understanding of our um, of the way that we read the the story of the Chinese and the Greek painters? Um, what I want the link I want to create here is the connection between the work of the artist as a painter, and the work of the poet. In the rest of the narration, Shapur starts, he says, you should, if you love this image so much, you should see the real thing. If you love image, if you like form so much, you should discover the mani, the mental contents, meaning the physical presence of, of Prince uh, Hosro. And he starts describing him. And the description of the beauty of this young prince it's so fascinating because he recreates through language what images were, were already doing, creating and adding a new lay, layer to the connection between the visible and invisible, between the forms, visual forms and the uh, and external reality. And this makes me think of uh, the line which we started today by Sadi, in which he says, sit with the beloved for some time, forgetful of this world and next you will see wondrous images more alluring than Chinese and Greek paintings for this meaning for this mani a form is required that, that only Sadi can beautifully craft so you can see how the poet in this case Sadi but it's something that Nezami was already trying to do the poet shows the possibility the chance that language has to mimic what visual arts can do and create a form for the money that are sought after by, by, uh, by the reader and, and the beholder. Anything that surfaces from the soul finds its reflection on the surface of the heart. And um, here we have another Ghazal, the Ghazal with which I want to conclude this session, in which Sadi says, do not describe for me your Greek or Chinese beauties. My heart is bound to one who came from our land. When he resurfaces to my memory, and only then, I lose a recollection of the existent and non-existent. The date is sweet, but the palm tree stands out of reach. The purest water flows right here, and yet we're thirsty. 
that sacred boy, Shahed, appears in our imagination, an onopious man in town refraining from desire. No object of gazes resembles his face, no fragrant bodies compared to his scent. Neither with him nor without do I seek a joyful life. A pearl like him cannot be interlaced with my same thread. Companions, shut down your eyes and look beyond. The mystery, again, the mystery we share with him is most concealed. Should everyone in the world see these forms of his, no one would grasp the holy meaning money behind his face. All of this to say that we could make use of Nezami to reread Sadi from a perspective of philosophical speculations on the role of imagination and vision and the visual arts. And we could read Nezami also from the perspective of a Sufi tradition, even though Nezami was not a Sufi, even though it does not really use Sufi language, techno language in his work, but we could re read his meditations on painting and visual representations through this quest, this alternation between forms and mental contents that appear in the Sufi tradition, elevated to the status of poet, uh, poetic art by, by Sadi and the likes. And then, thank you so much for your patience. I really lingered for too long. I'm, I'm done now. Thank you so much, Dominican. That, that was a really interesting uh, talk and insights into this complex world of vision, imagination, and artistic experience. And um, um, uh, audience, write your questions or points in the in the chat. So we have one. Uh, Harry, uh, Domenico, have you read Michael Barry's book, Figurative Art in Medieval Islam? He answers most of your questions. In Rumi, the uh, I have, I have, but I did not, I did not get the question. I did not, I did not get the, the answers I was hoping to find. <laughs> not yet, but I should probably reread it. <laughs> Consider right. it. And the second point is in Rumi, the Chinese paint and the Greek polish. What do you make of this reversal? It's interesting. I think that in Rumi's case, uh, the Greek polish, probably because Rumi was uh, located in Anatolia, he was located in Rum, and there is probably a connection with um, aesthetic practices that he could witness. The reference, I think that there's something that um, relates to the idea of, of spirituality belonging to Anatolia and the spaces in which Rumi was, was living hence the inversion of the roles. And, um, and, and the Chinese is just, they're just represented as, as, a, as a literary topos, as, as excellent painters. So I think that that's that. that, that. Oh, I want to talk about Rumi as well today, but we didn't really have time. It's, it's, a, it's also very fascinating. It, sure. it really takes the whole story to a completely different direction, denying the importance of external reality almost. Um... Kave Hemnat, I'm curious about your thoughts on the money story that follows or is interpolated at the end of the painting contest uh, story and how that might shape our reading of the painting contest inside the giant skull, as it were. Um, it's, 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 uh, I'm still thinking about it. It's, it's something that, you know, the, the, the image of the, of the, of the dog that is dying, that is the, the, the rotting, uh, dog that is on 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 the surface of the lake. It, it's uh, I'm still trying to understand also how the Artang or Arjang is mentioned in the story. Of, so there, there there must be an intertextual connection. But I'm, I'm still trying to to read how how the two narrations really relate to each other. But it's you know it's an important it's an important uh, transition that needs to be taken into account. And Carolyn Mauer, thanks for this exciting talk. Which modern visual artist poets have circulated these images further or nobody? I, as far as the late medieval period and early modern who are concerned, I will refer to Margaret Graves' recent chapter. Um, and uh, I, I don't really know much about modern, late modern or contemporary uh, here, you see, here we have Harry. So, Caroline says, Mat Michael Barry. Harry Matisse, for instance, yes, I, I, yes, this is fascinating too. Yeah. But I don't really know much about the modern, specifically modern uh, reverberations of, of this story. 
sure. Um, why, oh, Simon O'Meara, many thanks for your lecture for taking us to these marvelous poetic realms. My question is quite prosaic. Might acquiring and projecting be related to theories of vision? Um, intermissions ver versus extramission as to theories of the workings of the imagination? Uh, yes. Um, I only see intermissive, intermissive theory in this line of thought, in the Abyssinian line. I don't really see extramission as being particularly resourceful as a model. So it's, 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 it's the idea that it's, it's explained in very prosaic terms by both Avicenna and Althazar himself about the way that light penetrates the eye and then from the eye this stimulation these sensations are converted into perception thanks to the um thanks to the intervention of the of the uh common sense and then um and which is also in a way this theory is reflected also in how the heart can receive intermissively light from the preserved tablet or from the soul of the of the matrix of creation the soul of the fixed stars so the, it's 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 always this this metaphor of the light of illumination is is um it's a model that recurs constantly and um but i will look in, uh, at, uh, into that in, in my book i i um i refer to the Abyssinian theory of of uh optical perception uh, quite often, especially exploring how poets also were influenced by it. And Valerie Gonzalez, could it be that we are actually dealing with a Janus allegory of the painters so that the Chinese and the Greek are one and the same incarnation of the artist, metaphorizing the duality of form and content? It is possible. I think that this is one of the directions that Margaret Graves was taking in her chapter. Uh, but I would, I would, um, I would agree with you, Valerie. Uh, thank you for this observation. Um, it's possible so that there are simultaneously the two that represent the two facets of the painter, but also represent the two facets of the act of vision. I read the Farzane. I forgot to mention that the Farzane, the wise man who cracks this mystery, if it's not Alexander himself. And if he's not a natural wise man himself, could be seen as the as the rational intellect mediating between the visible and invisible, between the external and the internal, creating the connection between comparing the two things. The act of comparing between the two could be seen as as a metaphor for the for the rational soul, for the intellect of the human being as well. I, I believe, and and. Um, and that would also connect to what you say, Valerie, because because it it uh, it also through that the two aspects, the two facets of the rational soul, the theoretical and the practical intellect, that the work of art can be produced, right? So, so, so combining what is already the knowledge that is already part of of, of through experience and the the act of of, of creating art itself. Uh, could it be that, uh, no, sorry. Thank you for this fascinating talk. If you have time, can you talk a little bit more on how the story appears in Ruby and your take on it? Um, why it, it, we see um, both in Al-Ghazali and in uh, Nezami, there is a balance between the roles of the Chinese and the Greek painters. There's a balance in the, both sides, the contemplative and the speculative, the analytical and uh, more spiritual in the case of Al-Ghazali um, connect to each other, the two different paths. Rumi focuses only on the path of colorlessness. He says that the best color is colorlessness. So he denies the value of mundane experience in the quest for the divine presence, in the quest for the invisible which is something that occupies the center stage in, uh, in, uh, in uh, for sure, in Nezami, but also in Al-Ghazali, and in, uh, in, in poets such as, such as, Rumi, such as uh, Saadi, for instance, or Omar Tabrizi, and later on Hafez. So it's interesting to see, to see how these different authors were 
thinking different ways about the role of the body, to what extent the body can be uh, acquire more of an Aristotelian positive role in exploring the world and putting that exploration in the service of the higher aspirations of the soul. Whereas for Rumi, um, this is something that comes up very often in his works. It, the, 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 the body needs to be put aside almost completely in order for the soul to shine and connect with the divine directly. Thank you. Nicoletta Fazio, thank you, Domenico, for such beautiful lecture. I have a quick comment about the brushless painting ability, so to say, displayed by Shapur. I wonder if here it could also be a reference to the actual painting technique, polishing, burnishing the painted surface by painters to obtain a smooth, strokeless effect. Thank you. But the art historians should tell me about this. <laughs> I can't wait to learn. <laughs> I hope, I hope this is yes. The response is yes, I hope so. But I, I don't know, What's, what, what do you think? What is your take on this? I'm not qualified to respond that's, to this. That's one possibility. One, one question I, I had was, or oh, one comment I had is, is whether, you know, we can also talk about this, this acquire and project that you were talking about. Um, whether we can also talk about optical illusion uh, in this, you know, I mean, we have, for example, that uh, um, passage from al makrizi um, of a competition between uh, an Iraqi and an Egyptian painter, painters um, uh, during the Fatimid period. And they were, they decided to paint a dancing girl that would, uh, uh, be seen as entering a wall and the dancing girl that would be seen as coming out of the wall mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and of course the two you know did a magnificent uh, work etc etc of course the the passage doesn't tell you how they did it what the, what technique they used but I think it's a very important passage well on on one hand because it tells us that Fatimids had wall paintings, <laughs> which don't survive very much. But on the other hand, is this optical illusion that you can find in Pompeii's uh, uh, frescoes of exactly, you know, uh, flying figures or dancing figures that look like they're going in and others that look like they're coming out. So I just... No, yes, it's in, what, you, what you're saying also makes me think about the the anecdotes about money and illusion oh. and how the illusion is, is part of the process and creating something that cannot be touched. But again, it's it's um it's this uh, this idea that we we read these stories at times, especially when we read in Examy, through the lens of modern conception of 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 um exact respond mimetic correspondence between the work of art and the external world. And the way they're phrased on the surface level seem to match our modern post perspective <laughs> um, inferences. But there is something more, and, and the way that the imagination is involved in this process is particularly interesting. In the way that the act of comparing, the possibility of comparing between the work of art and the origin, and the quest for the origin, which involves experience and and the quest for experience in ways that do not necessarily they're not necessarily part of the discourse on modern perspective and 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 mimetic mimetic discourse it's it, there's something there that needs to be re re-explored and 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 is a master of of you know in in um in uh he masterly depicts this this quest for experience that stems from the realization that there is a correspondence between depiction and the depicted and 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 um and, and that's why i really love this this the, the slow pace of these narrations in which you see how the eye goes back and forth and then stops and that there is meditation there's the thinking involved and then back to the external reality and and this is exactly what happens in the moderate strands of sufi thought in not denying experience but actually using experience as a way uh, to, to to understand the divine 
not beyond the body, not in the body, but through the body. Um, thank you. Uh, Irina Bistron, um, some modern science behind our vision in blue and gold. And then I think, Irina, you attached something, but we can't really see that. I'm seeing it. It's a beautiful image. I don't understand what it is, though. Okay. Um, Nicoletta says, let's talk about it in Oxford. And Karen Pinto, thank you for a beautiful enlightening talk. Much food for thought as I contemplate cartographic visions of the world. Interesting. Um, I, I also wanted to, it's, it's more of, of a comment because you, you were talking about, you know, the paintings and how they sort of reflect the, these stories. And of course, you know, I mean, as art historians, we battle uh, for the relationship between text and image and uh, uh, to even be included into the art historical discourse. It took a long time before that happened. <laughs> but also we look at the agency of paintings uh, as not only commenting on the text, but also as expanding on it by providing wider contextualization that it's not necessarily prompted by the text itself, but also by providing a visual experience which is completely beyond text and uh, uh, creating a narrative of, in their own right. And, and uh, perhaps, you know, one could look at those paintings also in, in that way. Um, so, uh, you know, I wonder whether you have any thoughts on that. I um, I've been inspired by what by what Margaret Graves wrote about this specific story and how how mm. new experiences added to the experience of reading through the afterlives of those visual representations. Or the I this is something I want to look at more in detail from the experience of the circulation of manuscripts more than anything else and how mm. um, how um, important is the role of textual variants that are found, for instance, in the, in the Timurid period. How was the story of Nezami's half Pekar, for instance, of Sharaf Name, Excandar Name, Iqbal Name in this case, how, how are they changing in the manuscript tradition to accommodate different experiences of vision that were reflected you know, through the spirit of the time and also the visual arts, the way the visual arts were influencing simultaneously the, the, the reception of those works. So that's what I'm trying, that will, I, I'll try to do in Oxford, once at Oxford, I will try to sort of go beyond the idea that we need to establish an Ur text for mm. Nezami's works and ana analyze the history of reception of his works as something that is as a sort of self-reflective self on, on the way that was modifying the perception that readers had of the text through the visual arts, how the visual arts were guiding the eyes of, 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 of readers and, and copists in, in, in creating forging new lines, creating new connections between different portions of the text and sort of transforming um, at times radically the, the original text. Uh, so that's that's something that is it's worthwhile exploring because it will probably shed more light also on the complexity of the way that the poem, these poems were originally composed and circulated. Sure. And the uh, images that might have circulated early on and they're not available to us, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I, I was I was thinking that you know the, 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 mm, between the text and the and the painting. The, the third the third element is is like you said is the reception is is the the audience have we lost you no no I'm here, I'm here. so so you know the 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 element of of wonder of a jibe that you mentioned uh, results from the combination of the two in the person who is actually reading and 
and looking. So uh, that also to, to be explored. I wanted to ask you, um, so you talked about uh, Saadi and uh, Al-Ghazali and Azami, you talked about the esoteric experience and the uh, symbolic. I, I wonder uh, whether, um, what, what source Al-Ghazali used for the interpretation of, this, of these passages, of the, of the story? We don't, I think Al Ghazali is the, it should be the oldest specimen, the oldest narration of the story. I believe that the material were Central Asian, possibly related to money. Okay. Uh, there might be some Hellenistic influences. Um, Mar again, Margaret Grace also traced back some, some, some Hellenistic um subtext that might somehow connect with the story but we don't really know um it's it's uh it's it's fascinating but he creates a whole connection with his own system the way that he elevates the heart the way that he translates the rational soul of the Visenian tradition into the heart of the believer and how it connects with the invisible and how logic can also be applied to this quest for the invisible um, so he, he creates that, but but the source, the original source of the text is, you know, that is uh, uh, we, we have no idea. But it, there must be a Central Asian Khorasanian uh, connection, especially considering the, the the influence of of Buddhist visual arts and and uh, in, in, in Eastern Khorasan and, and and the way that ideas, anecdotes on competition between Greek and and Chinese, Turkestani Central Asian artists were. We're, we're, we're circulating wildly, probably widely at the time. So it's it's um it's it's a fascinating question, but I don't really see an answer. And I'm also glad Anna that you brought up the idea of uh, ajab and but the, these are key words that I'm glad that my grad students Julie is here. Uh, we've been thinking together about something that La uh, Lara Harb explored in her book on. On Badi, and uh, and also uh, Justine Lando a few years ago in the context of Persian uh, uh, Persian literature and uh, Persian manuals on literature and and rhetoric uh, have been uh, um, working on is 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 the the idea that poetry needs to generate wonder, amazement, and the rhetorical arts are something that is there to create that shegef, that shegefti, that Badi, that no now I in that Mezami uh, refers to. So I, I, I like the way that the poet is a meta, meta conversation on, on the art or writing poetry through the visual arts. So this, this, this connection is already so present um, from the perspective of what is the effect of forms when forms are manipulated, modulated and how they impact the soul of the onlooker, the soul of the reader. And, and, and I, I really, I'm really interested in seeing whether Nezami himself was considering the influence of, of uh, rhetoricians in the way that we're describing the effect of yes. poetry on the human soul and how this would be. And he saw this, this connecting point with, with the visual. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh... I think that would be a very interesting point to to explore further, yes. Well, uh, oh, Simon, uh, uh, might the distinction between textual images and painted and other images be overplayed in academia? <laughs> There's some, some interesting work on the idea, which I poorly summarized, that images are what are carried by, say, the photographs, the world, the canvas. Um. I go back to the idea of khayal, or imagination. That's, well, that's, the, that's the link between the two. Texts, verbal texts and visual texts ultimately encounter each other in what Avicenna describes as, as, as the locus of the production of images. Khayal or khayal, so the retentive imagination, but more importantly, even more importantly, the Composite imagination, where, where in this idealistic 
representation of how our perceptions work in the medieval context is 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 takes place in in our brain completely it's not it's, we don't see with our eyes we don't hear with our ears everything happens through the amalgamation of these of these stimuli and the way that they are present to each other through the common sense and then emerge through the through through the act of imagination and so from this point of view i believe that there's no real distinction and poets like Nezami and Sadi were trying to show this correspondence in multiple ways and it's hard for us to straighten this these threads that right because these are circular discourses that cascade upon each other but no i agree with you i think that this is the separation this distinction is 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 uh is overplayed <laughs> in our discourses but this is this is the language that we have so we need to come to terms with it uh exactly that makes perfect sense thank you i'm not sure it does <laughs> well um Domenico, if there are no other uh, questions or points from the audience, I just uh, want to thank you very much for the fascinating talk and also for answering all those very many questions, quite difficult ones. <laughs> and um, yeah, and thank you also for um, ending the RESIA program for this term. And we meet again in January in the new year. So a, a virtual applause to you and uh, have a good break, you and everybody. And thank you very much again. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure and honor. And yes, thank you so much for bringing these ideas with you. And this is, this is again, I, I, I emphasize it. It's a working process and, and I... Sure. And, and your your insights are absolutely precious. So I really hope that this this channel of communication and, and this conversation will you know will I hope will so. be kept alive. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye. bye.